There I'll you wait go. till it loads. All right, great. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's good to be here. I'm Mark Hillebrand, as Amanda already said, developer advocate for Red Hat. Previous to this, um, I've been the CTO of sort of a mid-market digital consulting firm called Tiger Spike. And prior to that, I spent five years in the digital consulting business, doing mobile apps and middlewares for those mobile apps. And before that, I spent 10 years in the video game industry. So I have some amount of developer experience, uh, you know, behind in my resume. And now I'm in a position to advocate uh, how open source can be used to solve a whole bunch of development problems that I, before joining Red Hat, I didn't realize just how far open source goes in terms of solving problems. Istio and some of its friends that we'll see as part of the service mesh family, these are examples of problems that open source is trying to solve. Um, now, our good friend Steven uh, has been playing up the dinosaur aspect of this talk. Um, I like dinosaurs as much as the next person, and I'm going to try and cram some dinosaurs in there, but they don't feature super prominently in this talk. So if you guys were expecting lots of Jurassic Park kind of shenanigans, um, you may want to leave the meetup now so that you're not disappointed. But I will use concepts of paleontology. Uh, so I'll just take you over the head with that metaphor uh, right now. So. Paleontology is a bit unlikely of a metaphor, but think of it like this. So a fossil record kind of tells a story of life adapting to evolutionary pressures coming in, right? And these life forms kind of adapt based on those pressures. So from that angle, let's see what happens when we apply it to our computational time scale. So in my time scale, I want to map those eras that you see to trends in product project management and then periods to broad computational innovations of a time period. For us, the fossils we find in our fossil record are architectures. And these are, you know, kind of the, the things that evolve under these two pressures of how projects are done and what technology is available. Uh, just for these slides, and we'll zoom in on this, I understand this might be somewhat small. Uh, yellow represents concerns that developers care about and blue uh, represents things that maybe administrators or operators would typically care about, sort of infrastructural concerns. Um, a key point that I'm going to run, the metaphor I'm going to be running through this is that architectures evolve based on project, business, and computational capacity of the epoch, if you will. Uh, so let's dig into this in a little more detail. See? See what I did there? Anyway, waterfallian is what I'm calling the era. Everything from the dawn of computing uh, all the way up to 1999. So let's call that the waterfallian age. Um, so this is very project manager-y kind of Gantt charts. You have your design and you move to implementation and testing and release. Uh, and that made a ton of sense when you were programming mainframes, right? So you see here, this notion of the true monoliths, when the true monoliths roam the earth, where programmers were actually programming on the very machine, as big as their house, that was going to run their programs. Um, and that architecture is pretty easy to understand. Towards the end of the waterfallian era, but, uh, up to 1999, you see more client-server applications, uh, where you get these layered architectures, these kind of horizontal layering. Uh, which you will still see, just like certain life forms that still exist today. Um, but usually you had a data layer and a business logic layer, and then you had the kind of a presentation layer, that, that classic mix. Um, so this, the end of this age is sort of where you start to get that divide of the operations kind of infrastructural people, and then the developers, the application concerns. So the blue infrastructural concerns and the yellow developer concerns. And that, if I move on to the next era, which I'm calling the Agilius era, this is the era that I'm marking this because this is my timeline and I can do what I want. Uh, February 2001. So that's the Agile Manifesto for those of you playing along at home. Um, also significant to this, to the, the periods, the internetic period, is uh, VMware introduces its uh, virtual platform. So you start to get virtualization becoming more of a thing. And with that, your client server architecture start evolving and they start evolving to deal more with kind of web traffic. And they can turn into fancier things in the Java world like application servers, big, big beefy things like that that are kind of segmented by layers. Um, also at the end of this era, if you will, you get the rise of service-oriented 
architecture and the wonderful, usually these, uh, so service oriented architecture, this is when the focus is on the service, you know, whether it's a, some endpoint that's SOAP based XML, God help us, or, you know, RESTful endpoints, but focused on the service. And usually those were backed by, uh, that could be backed by an enterprise service bus messages that they're picking up. Um, we'll get back to that in a sec. And we're finding ourselves in what I call the DevOpsic era. And this starts around 2009, by my reckoning, uh, with the companies such as Flickr, Netflix, uh, that were famous for doing tons with virtualization and containerization and cloud computing to achieve release cadences that we hadn't seen previous to this era. So they were releasing you know, whatever it was famously, like four times a day. And that was unheard of when that was first announced. Um, this this era is marked by like the internet is very much a thing and in fact uh people are competing for eyeballs and so devops which is sort of uh which i'm going to categorize as sort of this empirical kind of experimentation based quick release way of doing things it's agile it's lean it takes aspects of agile it starts to put pressure on companies and software development to have teams that are autonomous and focused around a domain as opposed to a layer. And it also puts pressure on lead times. Like you wanna be able to release quickly. And this is where, uh, if you see on this bottom here, you had your enterprise service bus type architecture, service oriented architectures kind of morph into these microservice based architectures with like a Netflix famously did. And the reason for that was that teams couldn't be autonomous. Each of these little microservices couldn't be autonomous if they were all bound by uh, enterprise service bus, which made release cadences difficult. So they evolved into these microservices and with it different libraries like you know, Hystrix and these things to kind of help ease the burden on each of these microservices having to deal with, as you see, these blue infrastructural concerns. And that's where there's some concern that we'll see in just a second. So my point in terms of this era and looking into the future, what will the future hold? That early microservice architectures turned infrastructural concerns, the stuff in blue, into application concerns. And for those of you that identify as developers, that is terrifying because most of the time a developer looks at YAML and they're like, oh my God, I don't wanna go anywhere near that. Or they don't wanna know about CIDR. They don't wanna know about VNets. They just wanna do their work and get it deployed. So the problem with that era is we come into this paradise lost kind of world where now things that we used to relegate to things, either a, a layered architecture, an app server, or even an enterprise service bus, things like logging, observability, sort of archiving, the network, these things are now issues for the developers of each of these microservices. So uh, to make sense of sort of why this is a bit of a problem, we have microservices here representing, represented by the creatively named services A, B and C, and we'll, this will make more sense as we get into our demo a little bit later on. So here's, a, here's one pressure that causes a problem. Now this is sort of the um, runtime complexity that comes from having microservices. Now imagine these three services not only are separated by network boundaries of some sort, but probably they're in different languages, which is kind of a pain. So you can imagine a world where Let's pretend the bug is here, and this is sort of the poison pill. Or if we were playing some sort of murder mystery game, it's pod, you know, service B that poisons service A, but it's hard to figure out how that bug led to this problem. So B does something that it shouldn't, feeds it to C, C just passes it on, maybe it calls the cloud, does some crazy personalization engine kind of thing, which comes back, feeds it back to C, C passes it back through B, and B gives it to A, at which point, a crashes and dies. Now, debugging this is bad enough if we were all in the same memory space, but it's particularly insidious if you don't have good tracing or good logging. And early microservices didn't have this because it kind of moved to the tragedy of the commons, the commons between all the microservices. So that's one thing that's a little sad about microservices. The second problem with these kind of DevOpsy based quick release 
vertically organized microservices is that now you have these where you a, a mighty fortress was your app server now you have to worry about things between services. So when we were just modules, A, B, and C, maybe being loaded in to a given app server, just for the sake of this example, you didn't have to worry about things like, well, what happens if module B isn't loaded really? But here, module B might be unavailable. It may not be loaded. It may be down. There could be any number of problems. And these are problems, these like negative test cases add cognitive load to developers. So how are they gonna deal with latency? Have they written enough code to think about like, well, what if it times out? And what if I send something through and you know, double write kind of problems? How do I know if this transaction actually worked even if it times out? These are all things that it's not great to give it to developers if they're constantly solving a problem over and over again. So that's not so great. Security, again, this is as you spread microservices around, you start to increase the surface area for attack. Oh, and I will point out that last side might be the last time you see a dinosaur. Don't, don't be sad, but here's a shark to help you feel better representing security concerns. Um, so yes, there are more points for attack. And this is something else we have to consider what, how we're gonna make sure only authorized people can talk to these services in a way that wasn't a problem when they were modules loaded in. Um, I'll go. Two more slides, and then I'll just check for questions, uh, Stephen and Amanda, because I know I'm just barreling on. Um, the good news, it's not all bad news. As some of you know, working with microservices, it opens up possibilities that weren't available to us when we organized our architectures differently. Um, a system, it, now we have this kind of chance to do things we couldn't do before. So this is where Istio starts to creep in. Um, so I'll just stop there. Are there any comments or questions before I kind of move on, Stephen? Um, I think we are quite question free. Your education must be impeccable. <laughs> or boring. One or the other. It's fine. It'll all be <laughs> over soon, everybody. Um, so I'll use this stock art to talk to my next way. So some of you may have heard me like I'm setting up this 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 whole thing about, oh, microservices. And you might be thinking, wait a minute, doesn't Kubernetes kind of solve some of this? Uh, doesn't it address some of the points I brought up? And the answer is kind of. So yes, Kubernetes is a bit of a, if you will, kind of a parallel in, uh, evolution that's looking to deal with how do I orchestrate all these different containers and make sure they stay up. So could Kubernetes, as this group would well know, it's really about a declarative way to make guarantees about deployment and lifecycle when it comes to containers. Um, but some of the things that we care about uh, in service mesh land kind of build on top of what Kubernetes brings to the puzzle. And that's kind of my point here. So let's just take a quick look. So <laughs> microservicility. So if if you're a any healthy microservice, uh, if you imagine it in the center there with the whole smattering of logos, all around the outside are some of the things that microservices need to be successful, right? They, uh, discovery, invocation, elasticity, these are all things that Kubernetes brings to the puzzle. So yes, Kubernetes helps microservices get off the ground and be successful. Um, but as you can see, there are other things that we want from a microservice and some of them I touched upon in our evolutionary pressures uh, that, that we need to address. So what we're kind of saying is that the adaptive pressure of this era, so that's a Mobius loop, by the way, a secret sign, you guys can look it up at Open Practice Library, it's meant to represent DevOps. The adaptive pressure of DevOps, the DevOps era, evolves our initial microservice into using Kubernetes, Istio, and OpenShift, we'll talk about that in a second, um, to this new kind of architecture. So the, the key point of this slide is, uh, wouldn't it be great if our blue infrastructure concerns could stay with infrastructure and our yellow application concerns could stay in application? And that is what Service Mesh is attempting to do. Just that, make it so that operations and developers, not so that they can be separate, but rather that they can specialize and work in concert. And that is the point of Service Mesh, which usually comes across to people as a constellation of features, and we'll see why that is. But all those features have this in mind. So 
if we look at it with our microservice abilities, uh, Istio starts to like beef up discovery, the ability to find other services. Maybe these services are cross clusters. It's a famous uh, capability of Istio service mesh, the ability of having a mesh that crosses clusters, as well as resilience authentication help, help with tracing, uh, monitoring and logging to some degree with the help of uh, service mesh. And because I can't help myself, OpenShift builds on Kubernetes and fills out many of these other things as well. I bring that up because the demo you'll see is OpenShift and think of it as Kubernetes kind of for the enterprise. There, that's the tagline. That's pretty much all I'm gonna say about OpenShift in this one. Now, service mesh is sort of the ecosystem at which Istio is at the heart. So service mesh is a collection of open source projects that work together to kind of deal with this adaptive problem that we have in DevOps, this kind of tragedy of the commons that we have where we want to take infrastructural concerns that developers were dealing with and pull it back out into something that looks like infrastructure with the help of our friend Kubernetes. Um, so I'm about to dive into Istio. We'll see a little bit of Jaeger and Kiali before we're done. Just double checking quickly, any questions, anything coming up, concerns? We're all we're all good. Cool. So now we're getting a little deeper into what is Istio. So some of you may have seen this logo. Actually, uh, maybe we'll throw up a poll because we can we can do that, and I'll do that. Let's see what a big boy I am and see if I can yeah. figure out how to use this platform. Uh, this one. Cool. So oh. I know. Look at that. Uh, yeah, some of you will have seen the logo before. I mean, before this point, before you saw that slide. Get an idea of where we are with Istio. Ah, some would recommend, that's good. People usually, Istio is a very polarizing technology. <laughs> that's what I've found. People have played around with it, excellent. Very good, I'll call that a quorum. Nice. Istio. All right. So remember, you will get a deluge of features. Try and organize them around, oh my gosh, I don't want developers to focus on infrastructure. I want to do something so that that stuff gets pulled out of the microservice and into infrastructure where it belongs. And we'll kind of see what that means. Therefore, here are some of the things that Istio will do for us as it sits in that space, that interstellar space between the microservices. It handles the control of traffic, so traffic flow, um, and it enforces policies. So service mesh will come up with this, but the basic idea is that it's a mesh of services and anything coming into the mesh and going out of the mesh is called north-south. So that's traffic that's coming into my mesh and going out of my mesh. And any traffic between microservices, that's called east-west traffic. And this is used in other ways, but particularly that terminology, but in service mesh, that's what we mean by east-west, north-south. So traffic management and policy enforcement applies both to traffic going in and out of the mesh, as well as traffic between services in the mesh. Um, observability is a big thing that Istio brings. It collects metrics and telemetry data from the different services in a way that we'll discuss. And security. While we're there, it can layer on certain, um, certain things and it does some heavy lifting that would otherwise be annoying for developers and infrastructure operators alike. So let's... Let's talk about that more as applied to our little toy app. So um, for the demo, most of it will be canned. Um, I might do a little bit of a live demo for the sake of our winning dinosaur. Um, but we're going to look at a demo app that's something like this. And it is nothing fancy. It's a bunch of, it vomits back text, basically. But it, use your imagination, your powers of imagination. You've already come on this paleontological ontological journey with me. Imagine we have a customer service that calls some preference service that calls some recommendation service. So just like I showed you in the slides before, service A, B, C, services A, B, C are customer preference and recommendation. Um, and you can pretend that, you know, hey, a customer logs in, they have preferences, we pass those preferences to a recommendation engine, and then that recommendation service passes it off to the cloud, I don't know, AWS personalized, whatever, and it comes back and it stores stuff in databases, all awesome, some sort of single page web app. Um, so that is 
representative, a canonical kind of microservices setup. So one thing I will show you, so we'll go live here. Um, so here's a, this is a cluster that actually exists right now. Um, this is OpenShift. It's just the developer view and it makes it clear what our toy app looks like. So I have a customer service as a version one and a version two. I have a preference service, which is in the middle. So customer preference and recommendation. And we have a recommendation over here, a recommendation V3, which if this all goes well, I'm going to take this Tyrannosaurus Rex. So we'll just kind of copy that and we'll make that the dino that we want to see. And then we will build this bad boy. So what we'll do, I'm just going to show that I can make a recommendation service. And then at the end, we'll see if I can get you guys to participate. And we'll see if you can see at least the text of your famous, your favorite dinosaur. Um, so that'll compile for us. And I'll just start a build for us. So what the, all this is doing is I'm going to start a build on the Kubernetes cluster, this OpenShift cluster. It's going to build it for me. And by the time we come back around, well, well before the time we come back around, that new service should be up. And I'll explain more a little bit later on. So cool. Well, that's boiling in the background. Let's look at some of these adaptive pressures and see. Well, first we'll talk about Istio, and then we'll look at the adaptive pressures. Um, my slides are reminding me what I'm supposed to be talking about. So when we're talking about Istio behind the scenes, think about it in three parts. So Istio people will talk about data planes, control planes, and arguably they'll talk about plugins, whether they know it or not. But data plane and control plane, these are these are key concepts. And this is the architecture of Istio, which you would see from the Istio website. Now, one thing to point out is you notice that there's a whole bunch of Istio itself is a bunch of microservices. Isn't it wonderfully self-similar? Now, I've got to tell you that an upcoming release of Istio, and this over here is the OKD Panda. He's the open source mascot of OpenShift, and he likes to tell it like it is. He keeps it real. In the next release of Istio, uh, all these microservices that Istio is made up of will be put into a monolith called Istio D, the Istio daemon. Um, why that's instructive is one, I don't want to lie to you lovely people, but two, it kind of goes to show that microservices isn't the answer for everything in the same way that there isn't just yet one life form on the planet Earth. There are many different ways to deal with adaptive pressures, and sometimes you'd be better off with a monolith. However, I'm going to continue, both because I didn't want to redo all my slides and I'm very lazy, but also because these microservices, as I'm representing them to you, is how it's implemented in earlier versions of Istio, and my Kubernetes cluster is using a 1.4 version of Istio. But even for later versions of Istio, the concepts will remain. Even if they're all put in one big happy Istio daemon, there will still be the concepts of these different things that you see, the pilot, the galley, the citadel. And we'll go into them because those concepts are helpful to understand what's going on behind the scenes. Mark? Yes. Do you think we can have a, a, a couple of cheeky but not pretentious questions? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we've got uh, from Sajid. Uh, it's asking, you know, what are some of the reasons you think that people do not recommend um, Istio, apart from complexity, what are the challenges that the customers face? Yeah, two that I've seen. So prior to about, you know, call it six months ago, it was still, it still felt a bit bleeding edge. So things wouldn't quite work the way people wanted them. Now, we've been keeping our ear to the ground pretty closely, Red Hat, and we know of big implementations that have been done using Istio. And from what we hear from our consulting team and our partners is, yes, it is ready for prime time. The two other things, you know, so that's one, I guess, is six months ago. The two things that exist right now that are barriers is one, Istio does add overheads, right? So you have all these little microservices that you see here, these are all have to be running on the cluster somewhere. And so they're gonna be eating up resources. Now that can all be worth it if you have enough microservices and enough need for this functionality. But a lot of people may say, eh, I'll just solve it with a library because all my microservices are the same language 
And all those, that cognitive load that your poor precious developers can't deal with, will just hide that behind a library. And all those microservices will use that library and it's awesome. And we've already got our logging and observation sorted out, new relic, you know, Dynatrace, whatever, pick a thing. Um, the other reason that people would not like it is because it still is very YAML based. I'll show you, I think in one or two of these kind of canned demos, there is something called Istio control, Istio CTL, which kind of tries to give you a command line. But uh, the amount of YAML turns developers off. And some of this is sort of for developers. It's sort of between developers and uh, sysadmins. But sysadmins might get turned off because Istio does some things that aren't always clear if you don't know the YAML. So that, leaning, that learning curve can be a bit steep, um, even if you're familiar with YAML, because YAML doesn't tend to have autocorrects and stuff like this. Uh, are there other questions? Hopefully that answers it. If not, we can take another stab at it later on. There is another quick question. What I'm going to do, though, I'm just going to fire up a quick, a quick poll for people just to click a few buttons whilst they're listening. Uh, now, the intelligence test, of course, is that I can't get back to questions whilst I'm running a poll. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so it was like, what are the considerations from uh, Bala? I think it was. What are the considerations uh, when selecting a service mesh? Uh, well, some of them are, some of them might say like, well, for one thing, like you got to buy or beware. Like one of the things that you need to worry about in selecting a service mesh is one, what kind of resources? Do you have the resources to make it worth your while on a cluster? And I don't want to scare people that like, oh, it's a ton of resources, but it is more, there are overheads in running Istio. Another one is uh, sometimes you have to consider now you're going to be routing traffic into your mesh through the Istio uh, project, whether it's the Istio D or these microservices. And you have to consider that that's, that itself is setting up a bit of a point of failure that you have to pay attention to. So how you architect your control plane, which we'll get into, you know, out of the box, it's pretty much okay, but you have to think about that. In terms of competitors to, to Istio, I'm not super well versed on other ways of, you know, I think it's was it fabric. There are other ways of doing a service mesh out there. But I think with Istio, one of the things that like, if I, you know, since I'm from Red Hat, one of the value adds that Red Hat does is make sure that these open source projects that I'm showing you all work together. Because Istio is rapidly changing, not quite at the pace that Kubernetes once changed. But you want to be sure that when you pick a version of Istio, that the tools you're working with are also compatible with that version of Istio because of this plugin architecture that I talked about. Um, beyond that, I'd say, I don't know, visit your local Google search or local library. I'm not super conversant on all the other way, other types of service meshes beyond the Istio-based service meshes. But if you have questions about that, you can feel free to ping me afterwards. I know a lot of people that know a lot about this stuff and can maybe assist you. But there you go. There's an, a starter answer. Excellent. No, I think, uh, oh, might have just one more cheeky one that's just come in. Uh, OK, so Herbert wants to know your magical input. He's actually saying that I realize there's no definitive answer, but is there a magic number? And how many microservices does it take for the system to double quote require yeah. a service mesh? I think usually you're in service mesh land. Like if you're starting cold and you're like, oh, I don't have any pre existing stuff, um, you're in service mesh land when your microservices are polyglot. So that's one. The second reason you might be in micro in, in service mesh land is because the features that I'll be talking about here are things that you desperately want to have solved in a kind of central way. So that might answer the question somewhat. So just from bottom up feature set of Istio. Um, a third version might be um, Kubernetes doesn't go far enough for you if you're running your services on Kubernetes, which is a reasonable assumption given this meetup. And if so, there are other things you want to be able to tweak in real time, just like you can tweak in Kubernetes. That might be a reason for service mesh, but that's sort of a subset of the features of service mesh, right? And to decide. 
but yeah, in terms of a number of microservices, you probably want enough that it becomes more trouble to reason about that area between the microservices than it is to take on the cognitive load of Istio and that layer of complexity. Um, once it's set up though, it's awesome. And it, it abstracts away a whole bunch of stuff from you, but you do need to understand it to be able to maintain it. Um, and that's where companies like Red Hat and whatnot will help you support these kind of things with their offering of Istio called Service Mesh. Um, but yeah, I think that's those are some of the considerations that it's same thing like, why would you turn things to microservices in the first place? Probably because you eventually get to a point where releasing a monolith is too slow and you can't compete. So you start breaking off pieces of that monolith into a microservice because you want to be able to release it faster, not just because it's trendy. And I wouldn't recommend using a service mesh just because it's trendy. Hey, Even though it is very trendy, you will you will impress your peers. And if it works on LinkedIn, why are they not going to get involved? That's right. <laughs> it's all about the battle for relevance. Uh, there's been a bit of the old uh, drums have been working here, and it's been suggested that Istio D was actually released um, a couple of months ago. Yeah, Istio one five. So it is out. Istio one five is out. I'm using a version of Service Mesh that uh, uses Istio one four, one four six, I think. So it's still. It's the last gasp for Istio microservices. But yes, in the wild, you will see Istio D, which is why I was keeping it real with all you people. This is one, one last little little question. Um, Istio does um, ingress. This is from Brendan. Uh, mm -hmm. Istio does ingress as well as service mesh. Uh, they currently use a Kong for this purpose, but I'm wondering yes. if they should consolidate to just Istio. Uh, I've heard of Kong. I don't know Kong well enough to reason about the two of them together. So I would advise Brendan to listen to my talk and then find a, somebody who's knowledgeable and independent when it comes to Kong and then weigh them up against one another. No, no, Sorry, we not... They definitely need to listen to you first. Definitely. <laughs> it's such a good well, because they're here but for no <laughs> other reason than convenience. Yeah. Hopefully that, that helped, uh, Brendan. No, no more questions just now? Okay, uh, I'll try and uh, motor through these a bit, being mindful of time. Um, so look, uh, this slide, the hero of this slide, if I sum it all up, when we talk about the data plane, the hero of the data plane is this Envoy proxy. So it has a lot of names, you'll hear it as the proxy, you'll hear it as the sidecar. Envoy, I believe is what it was called when Lyft popularized it back in the day. I believe they were the first to do it, which is sort of a ride sharing competitor to Uber in the US. So the Envoy is a high performance C++ proxy that mediates all inbound and outbound traffic for all services in the mesh. So each service gets its own little Envoy. So the Envoy is sort of Istio's control plane. It's proxy on the data plane where all your actual application services are. Um, in Kubernetes land, it leverages this aspect of Kubernetes, this notion of a pod where two containers, two or more, Containers can all inhabit the same pod and share quick network access and certain resources. So the Envoy slides right into that really well. And when you look at any service mesh implementation, Istio-based service mesh, you will see this sidecar proxy. Uh, and you may see this, the astute among you will see this in this demo, the little sidecar that pops up next to every service. And the Envoy is there to tell your microservice sweet little lies, and we'll see. And that's some of how Istio gets its magic. So the Envoy, super important. It's our, our gateway to the data plane. Now the control plane is really where Istio kind of lives. Uh, in Istio, the Envoy existed before Istio. I think if I've got my history right, like Istio started to be built up because they found configuring all these Envoys, if it was Lyft or whoever was using Envoys in, in Anger, realized like, oh, coordinating all these Envoys and making sure they all have the same view of the world is a labor into itself. Enter the control plane and Istio at the center of all this. So here are some of the microservices. Again, modules now in Istio D, the concepts still remain. You have this notion of a pilot, a galley, a citadel, a, a mixer. I'm not sure if a mixer and a citadel really fits with the pirate kind of metaphor, but uh, a pilot is really about making sure all the envoys agree and all the configuration gets out to the envoys. So each of these little proxies know what the main control plane wants. 
The mixer is all about getting telemetry from these envoys and allowing people to plug in to Istio as a layer of abstraction and ask questions about Istio. Citadel does all the TLS resources, uh, like neutral TLS. This is one of the features people go to service mesh for. Um, and the galley is all about abstracting away the platform that Istio is running on, uh, at least as it's been explained to me. So Istio isn't necessarily assuming Kubernetes. So as time goes on, that assumption gets a little more implicit. But the galley is meant to abstract away Kubernetes. And we'll, we'll see that in a, in a second. Um, and finally, plugins, that all comes in through the microservice that is the mixer, but this will exist in Istio 1.5 and beyond, I believe. And this is where uh, open source darlings like Prometheus and Grafana can pull in and get metrics and visualize metrics from the mesh. And also uh, Kiali, which is sort of a way of visualizing the mesh, which we'll see, which will feature in these demos, as well as Jaeger, which makes use of the kind of open tracing uh, conventions and allows you to see traces through your your mesh uh, without necessarily explicitly adding a bunch of uh, application level code to your services. This is all can be done unobtrusively. If we put all the com uh, components together, this is a bit of a busy slide. Um, and just one thing to bear in mind: remember, sidecar kind of equals envoy. But this is broadly how this service mesh architecture is being realized. Right, so you have your Kiali, Jaegers, Prometheus, plugging into an adapter and getting metrics out of the mixer. The mixer is getting its metrics from the sidecars. You're configuring things and the pilot is sending those configurations to all your envoys um, and TLS certificates. We're not gonna see that stuff in the demo, particularly now time-wise are going to your little sidecar here. Um, and as you can see, your application stays largely unaware. It's unobtrusive. It tries to be as unobtrusive to your application as possible. Um, let me see. Just quickly, quick, just quick terminology because this will come up in Istio and people can get lost in this because of the overlaps with Kubernetes. Uh, again, the pilot is the thing that was uh, evolved to deal with all these different envoys out there and trying to make them all match in terms of what the configuration should be and making sure every envoy has the most up to date configuration. Gateways are that ingress egress. So Kubernetes has its own notion of ingress, but Istio layers on top of it and says, no, 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 I wanna control a gateway and a gateway represents ingress. And then there's the notion of egress as well in Istio. So north, south into out of the service mesh. And then you'll hear about virtual service and destination rules, which is one of the reasons some, some people bounce off of Istio because it's like, oh, I already have services in Kubernetes. Why do I need to add this other layer of virtual services and destination rules? Um, and what is the difference between the two? Broadly, I would just say, remember that Istio kind of was evolved on top of Kubernetes without necessarily assuming Kubernetes was underneath it. Um, so when you see virtual services and destination rules, it's Istio adding a level of a layer of abstraction on top of the platform. So that it's not 100% dependent on running on Kubernetes. Um, you'll see some YAML. I, I don't know how much time we'll have just in terms of the time we have tonight, but I have some videos for you. You'll see some of the YAML kind of come through. This is what the YAML looks like for configuring like a customer gateway. Um, again, you'll, these slides will be available afterwards. And lastly, I'll just run you through sort of how YAML becomes control plane. So this is something you'll see a lot in Istio. You'll see virtual services and destination rules. Virtual service is sort of like, how do I address a service? And then destination rule is sort of, what do I do once I get to that service broadly? So the way Istio, Kubernetes and Istio communicates is through custom resources, right? So using extensibility of the Kubernetes API. So step one, you look like you're interacting with Kubernetes, but you're only doing so because you're applying to Kubernetes a bunch of custom resources, right? Kubernetes doesn't know what a virtual service is. It doesn't really care. It just says, cool, here are these resources, you know, based on a custom resource definition that it knows about. That then is where the galley kind of comes in. And it's like, it looks for changes in those resources and it translates them into Istio speak. Ah, oh, this is a virtual service. This is a destination. That goes to the pilot. The pilot knows where all the different envoys are and make sure that all the envoys get this update about what the state of play is for all these virtual services and destination rules. And now we finally get to a demo as much time as Stephen will allow me. Any we questions a, before I run into that? We have a couple of questions. It's like you read my mind. 
<laughs> mm. um, okay, so Mike, Mike's asking, does Istio support any other open source proxies besides Envoy? I think it's only the Envoy proxy. Um, you can test me on that, but I'm pretty sure it requires the it to be an Envoy. But okay, I'm, sure. let's call it 80% sure it has to be an Envoy. I'm putting. It, I'm just replying back to Mike saying yes, unless it's no. <laughs> there you go. Another satisfied okay. customer. Yeah. <laughs> Move along there. Uh, so we've got pa Paolo uh, is asking. He's got a couple of questions. Um, they're they're still using um, OpenShift three three one one, and he's asking, do they need to move to four to be able to play with um, Istio? Uh, I don't believe so. The what what tends to happen is that you won't get quite as uh, Cadillac level operator lifecycle support. So a lot of the all this stuff in my cluster was installed by operators, and the operator support isn't as great in three eleven. The other thing with OpenShift three eleven is you're you're tied to a version of Kubernetes that's a bit older. So while Istio doesn't depend explicitly on Kubernetes, you might run into some compatibility problems in terms of how a modern version of Istio works with an older version of Kubernetes. Um, if you look at the Red Hat support, or feel free to talk to me afterwards, the actual vicissitudes of how you set up service mesh on your cluster, I can I can help you with that. But no, I don't believe it's only an OpenShift 4 thing, but it certainly is easier in OpenShift 4. Awesome. We've got another another question uh, from Sajit, who is so going to be volunteered for a talk, it's just not funny. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure at all, Sajit. Um, do you see multiple gate? So the the question is: Do you see multiple gateway running on one cluster, or is the trend one gateway for many virtual services? Uh, this uh, so this might be a service mesh only thing, but uh, what you see in this demo is the control. You can have multiple control planes, each representing a different service mesh running in the same cluster which means you can have multiple gateways that are separate projects. And one control plane could be down without taking down all the control planes. Uh, I know previous versions of Service Mesh, which used a version of Istio, there was one central Istio control plane project, and it managed all the different control planes from one central project. But that made too much of a single point of failure. So whether that's something that's specific to Service Mesh in terms of Red Hat's view of Istio, or whether that is a configurable thing in Istio, I can't say 100%. But certainly, yes, you can set up different gateways. And these different gateways could be actually separate control planes. Whereas earlier versions, there was one control plane that could have effectively multiple gateways that would route requests to different different data planes, if that, if that makes any sense. That's uh, all, all cool. So there's no there's no questions just now. Cool. I shall pass right. on back over to you whilst flicking up a quick poll. Oh, cool. Well, while people are looking at that poll, uh, I'll just talk a little bit about, remember the issue about runtime complexity and how do we deal with timeouts and latency and all these other you know net failures that we have to deal with. So Service Mesh adds a couple features that can help us with um, observability, right? And that's kind of what you will see here. So this is our good friend, Kiali. So two things that I wanna show you with this, by the way, looks like our build got pushed up successfully. Good for us. Uh, if my, uh, my load is not running, let me just start the load. So we'll, we should be able to see this in real time. So I'll just start sending traffic to my live version. We'll kind of come back to that. Um, this is something I prepared earlier. So what you see here is, let's pretend I had a service mesh, just like the one I've been explaining to you with the same demo app. And I start putting load on that app. And I'll just scrub through this a little bit. As you can see, there's some errors coming through. Sorry that my Scrubber is kind of in the way. It's a whole mess of errors. Like, what in the world is going on here? If you're faced with this issue after a release, you can jump into Kiali. So I'm just finding the Kiali endpoint there. 
and I can see, ooh, there's a problem with this service mesh, the demo app service mesh. And Kiali, what you can see here is it's animating traffic. The triangles represent virtual services. The squares represent sort of destination rules, but really kind of Kubernetes services. And what I, I can also display nodes that aren't being active in my mesh, like this recommendation version three, which is where our dinosaur hopefully will eventually appear, or at least the name of our dinosaur. Kiali helps you to inspect like, oh, I noticed that traffic between for recommendation version one, 100% of that traffic is without error, but 100% of the traffic going to version two is with error. Mm, that seems to be a problem. And then I can use something like Jaeger, um, and some of you may have experience from of Jaeger in the past. I can dig into Jaeger and look into these different tags. Like I can see some of the headers that came through and tags that came through. Um, yeah, basically tracing, traces and spans. Uh, so in real time, uh, this graph should be up to date now. You can see my local version is only running through a version one of a customer going to preference and then splitting right now between two versions of recommendation. And my my local version isn't isn't broken right now. Believe for me, it will be soon, I'm sure, after I start poking at it in the demo. Resilience. So um, with resilience, there's a couple different things here. So Istio adds a bunch of features that make it easy to kind of test resilience. So there are applicant application level things that you do have to deal with, like, well, what happens when something does timeout, not just checking for a timeout. And Istio makes it easier to test for this stuff. So things like you may have seen um, in, you know, the Simeon army, Netflix's whole kind of chaos monkey and that whole thing. If you see here, fault injection, remember we have the envoys who tell the services sweet little lies. I can through Istio say, hey, I want you to inject a fault for this. Whenever you try and go to service B, I want that to return this kind of error and or this with this kind of delay. And the envoy will make it seem to service A like it got that error and service A will then have to deal with it. Um, so that's a feature that Istio adds to help out. The other thing it does is for, you know, we all know that a DevOps view of the world says that things will fail in production. The trick is how quickly we can remedy those issues. And one thing here is that, and again, Kubernetes, its declarative nature is also kind of, you know, you roll the punches. Istio adds on top of this, adding the ability to say, when I see certain types of errors, I want to time out. I want to try every five times. I want to try five times before I say it's a it's a real error, or I may want to you know wait 15 seconds before I report back to the presenting service that there was an issue. Uh, and this can be very powerful, particularly if you are trying to put older, rickety, or slightly unstable things in your mesh. This is a way that you can kind of smooth out those errors without having to write all that code and put it in service A. The envoy is sort of making that making that a reality for you. Uh, I can answer questions about that as well. Security, like we talked about, what do we do about the increased surface area? Uh, two big things. One is, uh, one is sort of an opportunity that the service mesh gives us. So sort of like things you would see in AWS through like API gateway and, thing, and things like this. The service mesh can handle uh, dealing with tokens. So it can handle a checking that a token is valid with a given authority making sure issuer and claims are all legit. This is things that can happen in the mesh. So making sure service B can't talk to service C without a valid token, uh, Java web token. And also the mutual TLS is a big deal. That's one of the things that we see with people using service mesh and anger. The ability to set up mutual TLS between services is one place where Istio really shines. Back to the question of, should I use Istio or why should I use Istio over other service meshes? This plus the certificate rotation. From what I hear, people on the ground, this is a huge selling point that sometimes gets overlooked. And I will overlook it because I don't have time to show it to you in this demo. And then the adaptive opportunities, which leads us to our last bits of the demo, um, a dark release. Some of you may understand dark release or know it in a different name. Um, Istio gives you the ability to mirror traffic. So if we go back to our, uh, our friends here, so remember in this video, we were looking at a recommendation version two that was failing. Well, that's no good. 
I don't want my end users to have that kind of an experience. So what we see here is here's our service failing. So here I am in Visual Studio Code. I can bring up my YAML to say, hey, virtual service, whenever you head for recommendation, I want everything to go to version one, but whatever goes to version one, I would love for you to mirror it to version two. So that's sort of a dark release way of doing things. By mirroring, that means the end user only sees the route through version one. And that's what you kind of see here, the, the magic of time-lapse photography, that over time, the mesh appears to heal from the end user's point of view, and fewer and fewer requests are going to V2. But Jaeger shows us behind the scenes, when we look at the traces here, that there are still errors buried in this, but the errors, as hopefully you can see, I know it's a bit small, the errors are coming in on the shadow. So shadow is sort of the mirrored kind of trace, right? And that leads us to an opportunity that I'd like to show here. So if I have that error in a dark release scenario, and again, actual mileage may vary, I'm assuming broadly stateless services, um, I can debug. So this is just showing off the fact that look at me, Visual Studio, if you haven't tried open folder and container, it is awesome. And that's all I'm kind of proving here, but let's skip through that. One thing I can do when I'm running things in a container like this is that I can also use the Istio plugin, whether I'm running in a container or not, to be honest, and connect to my cluster, this extension, the Visual Studio code. And again, I set up the this service to allow for connections from a debugger. You may have to set up you know, the appropriate environment variable to allow that to happen, but I can debug into version two and see what's going on. So what you're seeing in this demo here is that I can attach to that service. So I send one request, it lands in my debugger. I can check the count. The count will be in like the 7,000s because it's been getting hit previously. I can look at this local variable and say, oh, misbehave, that's true. That seems like a bad thing. And then I can move on to kind of get to the bottom of what the heck is going on there. For the sake of, for the sake of time, I'll skip through all of this, just proving it like, yep, the error came through. And it turns out, oh, the issue was an environment issue. Because I was saying, if I can't find this environment variable, set the default misbehave to true. Well, that's not what we want at all. So I can recompile that. The other thing I can do, because we're in Kubernetes land, is instead of compiling and releasing, this is an environment variable. So from a dark release, I may have realized that, oh, a slightly less risky way of fixing this would be to actually fix the environment variable itself. And this is just showing the fact that I can quickly, from the top topology view, find the service I want to look at, update its deployment. Uh, and I'll just, again, skip through this due to time. I'm basically going to add this misbehave variable, set it to false, stupid, if only all bugs were this easy. And then what we'll see, what I'm trying to prove here is that the problem should be solved now. So I can still send stuff through the mesh. That's great. And still no issue, that's good. But the thing that should be new is that if we look at Jaeger, Going into Jaeger here, I find recent traces and all the recent traces now don't show any errors because the mirrored service is no longer showing an error. And that's what we're gonna quickly dive into here. So there you go. Now, if I go back to our slides for a second, just a couple more features and maybe a, a dinosaur at the end. So rate limiting, this is another thing that Istio brings to the table. If you don't wanna do it yourself, you can limit uh, calls between uh, different services. Another thing that Istio is famous for, or service meshes in general can be famous for, is this notion of a circuit breaker, which is basically saying apply back pressure uh, when there are resources downstream in terms of this diagram that you want to protect. So what this is trying to depict is let's pretend a huge volume of requests come from service A to service B, and service B wants to protect downstream a fragile database or a mainframe or something in the back to avoid a more catastrophic failure, just like a circuit, circuit breaker or a fuse in your house and how electricity could melt a fuse. This is something that can be applied at a 
service mesh level. Without changing any code of your services, you can apply this kind of back pressure and cause failures earlier uh, instead of later when they're more catastrophic. The other thing you can do is it adds ability for uh, canary releases. So I showed you, oh, we found a problem with our uh, recommendation v2, and then we updated the environment variables. Um, you can also do this kind of stuff in Kubernetes as well. But just to show you how you can do it in Istio, and Istio adds some functionality on top, which hopefully we'll get a chance to show. So what I'm showing here is here's a virtual service. So I'm updating that same recommendation virtual service. But now I'm saying, you know what? You can go to version 2 25% of the time. And this Istio control, this shows you Istio's view of the world, so apart from Kubernetes. And it's saying, yep, I agree. Um, I see version 1 and version 2. There are two routes. Now when I apply the YAML, what we should see is that now it will show the split of traffic to be 75-25. And that's what you see there before I quickly switch to the other side. And now again, with the magic of time-lapse photography, we can see that over time, because this is a weighted average of the number of requests, the traffic is shaped to 75-25. So now I can slowly put my recommendation version two back into production. Cool. Any questions before I get to the last bits of my demo? I've got like three minutes left. Any questions out there, Stephen? Yes, there is. Uh, Bre Brendan, Brendan Brown has just said, is um, Istio um, East-West comms even relevant anymore with Kafka? Uh, yeah, so is it, the assumption there is what? Everybody just communicates through a queue, so what does it matter, right? You're pushing, pushing things into a queue, and then you won't, you won't have this directive A calls B, B calls C kind of thing. Um, yes, though, I suppose some of the implementations I've seen when you're dealing with Kafka is you might have things picking, uh, picking things off a queue, and sending them to something like when you're in Kubernetes land, maybe it's Knative, maybe you're spinning up some sort of service on the back of something in a uh, Knative queue. I believe a service mesh can live on top of those things because behind the scenes, there is some microservice that is taking something off the Kafka queue and calling something like a Knative, uh, even though that's a bit behind the scenes. But yeah, it's a fair point that if everything is going back through Kafka, uh, you are a bit in service mesh land. Though the only thing I would add to that is, uh, do you already have, is Kubernetes giving you enough of the observability and logging, or do you have a separate solution that allows you to see what A, B, C, D are doing and an ability to trace through all these different services? But yes, this demo is very much focused on point-to-point -point services calling one another. Any other questions? Hopefully, yeah, my good God, they're flooding in here. My oh, good God, people are getting really warmed up. Uh, okay, so Vikas is saying, uh, any word, words of wisdom about using um, Istio with Flagger? Well, I'm not familiar with Flagger. So my words of wisdom are no. <laughs> <laughs> Limited and concise. Swagger, Sorry maybe. About that. No, that's, that's a new one of me as well. Uh, let me see if we've got uh, maybe one here using flaggers. Okay, so David is complimenting you on your talk, which is wonderful feedback. Uh, he's buttering he's... me up for a difficult question. Yeah, exactly. What is the square root of 5 million? No, I'm kidding. Um, he's, he's also using a flagger for setting up blue green. Um, Blue Green releases presumably in Kubernetes. I was looking for an implementation in Istio. Are there any useful tools that you've used in Kubernetes that have that have not been mentioned in this talk? Spill your beans. What are all the secrets? <laughs> um, most of the tools that I've used are coming from a developer's point of view and not an administrator's point of view. So you know things like I mean, hundred dollars a click. Yeah, exactly. Credit card, paywall yeah. is going to come up. Uh, 
possibly for the sake of time, maybe maybe we'd take that one offline. But I mean, things like draft for like setting up projects quickly, or if you're in the OpenShift kind of ecosystem, OpenShift do for kind of tools that set that stuff up. Of course, you for logging, if you want to look at logs really quickly, Stern is pretty cool. Um, there are other, um, yeah, there are a whole bunch of tools out there. Um, but yes, maybe maybe a chat offline is most appropriate or, or see me on LinkedIn. That'll be part of my, uh, the, the links that I provide you guys. Awesome. Uh, one last check. I think, I think we're all good. If Amanda's all right. still there. Yeah. <laughs> if I didn't put Amanda to sleep. Um, you've, you've survived. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the last little bit, this uh, this is just sort of the coda to our talk here. Um, A-B testing. Um, so this is something that Istio adds on top of Kubernetes. So it acts a bit like a layer seven load balancer in a way. So it has the ability to inspect headers that come through. So one way, uh, one thing that I'd like to show here is like, well, what if I had a version of my service that I only wanted to show to iPhone users and I had a different version that everybody else gets. And the only thing that makes this a little more difficult is this is a service deep in my mesh. So I want the ability to a service deep in my mesh to change its response based on whoever called it up front, north, south kind of traffic. So to that end, you will remember that I recompiled a version of our recommendation controller here. So recommendation v3, sort of like the one we saw in the videos from before. And what it should return is uh, something that tells us the best dinosaur is blah. So if this all worked, uh, which you will see here, sorry. So recommendation version three, the best dinosaur is blank. And we said it's Tyrannosaurus Rex. If you could take out your phones, try and go to this endpoint. So that's a cluster that's live right now. And tell me what happens as a result of this poll. So what you should be able to do is either tap in the bit.ly link or try and use that QR code um, and see if you got the right dinosaur. Now, it could be that I set this up wrong because I was honestly rushing a bit to set this up just before the talk. Um, but if you don't have an iPhone, you're not going to see the dinosaur. I'm sorry to say it's looking for iPhone in the header. Um, and while you're doing that, again, for the interest of time, I'll show you what this looks like when it's set up, when you, the way it was set up. So if I had my recommendation version three, you can see here that I can set up this header, this virtual service recommendation header. And you can kind of see where the YAML can start to get a little bit involved, where I'm setting up here, hey, when I match, a header called baggage user agent. The baggage is just a, a prefix that it puts on user agent as things are passed down the mesh. And then I have these different destinations. And I say, if I match iPhone OS, go to version three, otherwise go to version two. And what this is showing here is I can use Istio control to, let me just move this out of the way, to kind of show me, hey, when I see a header that matches this regular expression, iPhone OS, then go to version three. And then this kind of proves over here when I've set it up correctly, pretend Android goes to the normal endpoint. And if I go over here and set up a header that looks like an iPhone header, I just uh, skip ahead, I should get back version three, which says for iPhone users eyes only. And there's a grammatical error in there. And again, so a little bit back to the question of tools. Um, the let me just get this out of the way. The Istio control also has some analyze features. Those of you who've used it before, that allows you to look at your mesh and look for misconfigurations of the mesh. Um, so they were previously experimental. I think they're real features now, which can help. And that brings me more or less to the end of my talk. If you'd like to try. Service Mesh, I just have to plug this one thing that's very relevant. Uh, Red Hat is doing a workshop, totally complimentary. 
kind of do at your own pace. It's the new casual, everything's virtual, but we do require people register for it. And there's one coming up on Thursday. These run every couple of weeks uh, during this COVID crisis, but this gives you a chance. You'll see some of this presentation probably if I'm running it, uh, but it also gives you a chance to be very hands-on uh, with Istio and try it for yourself and configure it con correctly. Uh, let me just actually change to the slide because I realized you guys were watching that. This is the thing, this will be available in the slides or you can contact me if you want the slides afterwards. And the last thing I'd say is that if you have more questions, you can reach me either on Slack, join our developer group, our Slack channel. Like I try and make it easy as an advocate to talk to people who wanna know more about Red Hat or you know open source in general, because Red Hat loves the open source thing. And in this presentation, here's a dinosaur again, and there's a link to my LinkedIn profile. So if you like this, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I might even connect with you. Um, tell me the talk was good and I'll connect with you. Tell me it was bad and we'll see what happens. And that's that's my talk. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Stephen, Amanda. Thank you all you lovely people.